the stage is set. When I whoop this man, I want to be declared by all as the greatest of all time. That's right. Because the stage is set. I'm 32 years old. My legs are gold. This man is strong. You talked about how great he was, and now we're going to see. We are the champion and the number one contender, so I'm pretty sure that it'll be a fight from the first bell to the ending bell. I predict that you'll, you'll be seeing a good fight. He was the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world, who also possessed a well-earned reputation as a fierce knockout artist. The challenger had won the title at age 22, been forced into retirement, but still called himself the greatest. The two would meet in the heart of Africa, and today we'll take you there to relive a story chapter of boxing history. I think that Mohammed, like Joe Frazier and all these guys at this stage, can only do what I let them do. And I'm not intending to let them do much. In the autumn of 1974, it was accepted as fact that George Foreman had the boxing world in the palm of his powerful hand. Soon after capturing the heavyweight gold medal at the Mexico City Olympic Games, he had begun a ferocious assault on the professional ranks. The culmination of his ascent was a shot at Joe Frazier's title, but it was over in two rounds. And so began the reign of boxing's most intimidating champion since Sonny Liston. Well, I think I'm near and possibly the best of condition I've ever been in. i got more to train for now. And whenever you got a lot of obstacles in the way, you got to be in the best. And somehow something inside me tells me to work my best now. Foreman's second title defense served to further his devastating reputation as he made quick work of Ken Norton. I hope to stay as active as possible. I'm not interested in one contender no more than the other. I think that Ken Norton is the, the beginning of a lot of big things for me in boxing. At age 26, Foreman had an aura of invincibility that overshadowed all of his peers with one exception. The whole world will have to bear witness that Muhammad Ali is the greatest of all time. Muhammad Ali was 32 in the fourth year of his comeback from a forced retirement following his refusal to be drafted during the Vietnam War. A Supreme Court ruling freed Ali to return, but a decade had passed since he upset Liston to win the heavyweight championship of the world. Get up there, Joe. Get up there. Get up in the ring. The man is sore. The man is flat footed. The man don't stand a chance. The stage has been set. This man is supposed to annihilate me. Ten years from Sunday Liston, I was supposed to be get it that time. I think it's befitting that I go out of boxing just like I came in, shocking the world by beating a big, bad, ugly monster that nobody could beat. Ali's road back to contention had been anything but smooth. He was knocked down and beaten by Frazier in their legendary first fight. But three years later, Ali earned another title shot via decisions over Ken Norton in a rematch and by defeating Frazier in their second of three meetings. Facing the prospect of challenging the ferocious foreman, Ali began to attack in a familiar fashion, the verbal barrage. You all talk about I'm old, about my legs are gone, but you forget that I danced 12 rounds with Joe Frazier, the 11th and the 12th round I came on through. The Ken Norton fight that pulled me out, the 11th and 12th round I came on through. I'll dance every minute, every round, and I want George Fulman's for men and this man over here, Henry Clark, the number six contender, to go back and tell the man to be ready for a dance. Dance! Are we gonna dance? Dance all night long. Are we gonna dance all night long? Are we gonna dance all night long? Are we going to dance? All night long. Yeah, let the man we say something. Let the man talk. Once again, Muhammad Ali found himself in great demand. The WBC and the WBA mandated the fight. The public certainly wanted it. And the media clamored for it. All that was necessary was one man to put this together. Well, the fight is scheduled, the fight between Muhammad Ali and George Foreman, there is a fight, supposedly. <laughs> I don't believe that fights really take place until they actually happen. So there's a chance, like everything, that things don't exist. Uh, but there has been a date designated as uh, September 24th in Zaire. Both Muhammad Ali and George Foreman were guaranteed $5 million apiece. 
Well, he had to have a great deal of luck to find an emerging African nation who was willing to put $10 million up for recognition. That he found in Zaire. Then he went to George Foreman and said, I got the money, and I got Ali to sign. That's kind of half-truth. And George said, well, go see about Ali. He went over to Ali and said, I got Foreman and the money. When the smoke all cleared, he seemed to have $10 million in the bank and both fighters' names on a contract, and the fight was on. If Muhammad Ali want to fight me and the promoters are willing to put up $5 million, to be honest with you, I'll fight 20 Muhammad Ali's in any, any given day for $5 million. <laughs> well, he says now he can stick and run and beat you. Well, he'll definitely have to do it if, to beat me, stick and run. <laughs> I'm going to be running him through the jungle. With the unprecedented purse assured, Foreman marked the beginning of training for his third title defense by holding a picnic in California. A young reporter named Bryant Gumbo was there. George Foreman's training camp on the county fairgrounds in Pleasanton, California, is in a mineral display shed. While there's nothing impressive about the champion's surroundings, the champion himself is certainly impressive, working in a ring in which temperatures often exceed 100 degrees. His sparring sessions aren't just a training routine. They are instead intense efforts by sparring partners to simply survive a three-minute round with a man whose punching power is frightening. It's this type of hard work that has George believing he's ready to defend his title against Muhammad Ali. I feel like I'm in the best of condition, and I, was, I would have been able to fight a couple of weeks ago, I feel. Are your thoughts going against Ali? Have they changed from the time when you were going in against Frazier? Are you a little more confident now? Uh, I realize the things that I can do now, of course, because I've been doing them a lot more now. I realize that I'm a champion, and because I am a champion, it means that I've practiced hard, a lot harder than the other guys around. So I, I'm pretty well confident now that I, confident that I can do all the things that I want to do. Five million dollars is what Foreman will be paid for this fight. Some say no fighter's effort is worth that much. But worth it or not, George Foreman is hard at work these days, earning his money, prepping for yet another fight of the century. Bryant Gumbel, NBC News, Pleasanton, California. As for the fight itself, discussion centered not on who would win, but on how much punishment Foreman would dish out. I'm not going to destroy him. There's nothing you can... This man has been talking since he started boxing. People have broke his jaw, knocked him out. One guy knocked his leg so far up in the air, I thought he was going to take off. <laughs> And he got up and started talking. So there's no way I'm going to be able to stop him from talking. <laughs> I'm not... Training back east, Ali stopped at nothing in an effort to steal some of the champion spotlight. Ali, the entertainer, was having some difficulty figuring a new way to get a little more publicity for his upcoming bout with George Foreman. So he let the word go out that he might like to buy himself a helicopter and then proceeded to get behind the controls of one at his training camp in Deer Lake, Pennsylvania. That got the expected attention. When the man who says he's the greatest spoke of his opponent, the voice was quiet but sure. He protected me with one good shot as possible. But the odds are any wise man wouldn't bet on him. Rumblechamp! Rumblechamp! Ali is betting very heavily on not letting George Foreman tag him even once. He still feels he's the better boxer, is in better condition, and has the experience and skill to beat Foreman. Bill Morris, NBC News, Deer Lake, Pennsylvania. Ali even had a plan for dealing with the need to fight at 3 a.m. Zaire time in order to be seen live in the United States. I got a punch, Kid Gavilan, something called the Bolo Punch, which you're naming the Ghetto Wapo. <laughs> How you doing, kid? Show me that kid. He's, uh, George throws the right. Uh, see? Try it again. Uh, I got you. Then we will name it the Ghetto Whopper. The reason it's called the Ghetto Whopper is because the reason that punch is called the Ghetto Whopper is because that punch is thrown in the ghetto at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> And I thought, started listen, hitting power didn't mean nothing because usually I fix the word they can't find nothing to hit. So I never worry about hitting power. So a man like George that comes out with those big... Mocking Foreman's punching style and questioning his stamina became a recurrent theme for Ali. He's the one on point. Round two, back out with the stick. There's some fakers, you know, using that reach, getting in a quick... I can do that quicker than him. He's more of a... 
worm. <laughs> send me, send me around to be puffing. He'll be breathing. I'm a set me round man. I'm used to going 12 rounds. I'm used to, that's my thing, dancing and sticking. I'm not boasting you all. Don't say I'm boasting or I'm a cocky fella. I'm just talking the truth. Because I know. Fighters know when fighters are in condition. That's right. Fighters know oh, when fighters are in condition. Right. The press knows when we are in condition. That's right. See? The press knows. Oh, 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 oh. Can't hit the butter. The press knows. Can't hit the butter. <laughs> located in the heart of Central Africa, the former Belgian Congo. In 1974, the entire populace seemed mesmerized by the prospect of hosting Muhammad Ali. The Ali Circus arrived in Africa about two weeks before the fight. Thousands turned out in the hopes of catching a glimpse of Ali as he made his way into the capital, Kinshasa. Both fighters were received by Zaire's president, Mobutu Sese Seiko, who portrayed the big event as a gift to his people. Mobutu was also keenly aware of his country's rare chance to be on an international stage. We knew that uh, the fight was going to be shown all over the world. He was going to put our country, the image of our country, uh, uh, in a very large uh, uh, public. Before the fight, we, make, we give uh, many communication, many news, and the people now, they know they're here. This fight occurred at the time of a great black awakening. Black is best, black is beautiful, and both camps felt a great affinity for the emerging third nation of Zaire from the third world. And in so showing this affinity for brotherhood, they dressed as they conceived the Africans would be dressed. Therefore, they came in dashikis off the airplane. They had large afros. And when they got off the plane ready to embrace their African brotherhood and bond and great black friendship, they found that the Africans did not dress as they anticipated, but they dressed as most Americans and Europeans dress. Of course, they didn't have a good idea about uh, the, the African people, how they live, uh, what they do, how they, dress. Uh, how they dress. But when they come here, they, they, and they see. Having seen an unexpectedly modern Africa, the foreman and Ali contingents had distinctly different visions of where they would be the most comfortable. The champion chose downtown Kinshasa's western-style hotel while Ali lived and trained 40 miles out of town in the Sully. While George Foreman was stuck in a downtown hotel, besieged by fans and media attention, Muhammad Ali, 40 miles away in the Sully, was nice and peaceful and quiet, luxuriating in these villas with a band of hardy men around him and the rest of the villas. The Ali Circus congregated here for one purpose alone, to get Ali to win the heavyweight championship of the world and take it away from George Foreman. Now, Ali had one particular advantage. He had brought Lana Shabazz, his own cook, with him and her vast supply of home cooking. Now, George Foreman was riddled with anxieties in, ho in his hotel, meanwhile, because he thought his food was being poisoned. A notion put there by the irrepressible Drew Bundini Brown, who lost no chance to tell a hotel staff that we were poisoning George Foreman's food. The vibrations are against him, the planets are against him, and already he right. lost the first five rounds. Right. Is that right? That's are right. we in the days? Well, float like, like a, a butterfly, butterfly and sting like a bee. Huh? Rumble, young man, rumble. 
Despite Boudini and Ali's best effort at psychological warfare, Foreman appeared oblivious to their bluster, mainly because although both fighters trained in the Sully, they rarely saw each other. Reverent crowds gathered to witness Foreman's daily workouts, which were highlighted by the booming punches unleashed on his sparring partners. As the champion's entourage made the hour-long trek back to town, Ali's sessions would commence. No hushed atmosphere here. African drums accompanied the challenger's every move as he trained with a nearly religious fervor for his chance to regain the heavyweight title. Preparations of a different sort were underway in Kinshasa as Mobutu's new sports stadium was readied for the expected crowd in excess of 60,000 fight fans and civic-minded citizens of Zaire. Except for a small VIP section, stadium seating was non-existent. No seats, no tickets, no ticket numbers, no seats. So the tickets were ordered anyway from Philadelphia, and three or four days before the fight, the tickets came in. Major crisis. President Mobutu's name was misspelled. Back went the tickets to Philadelphia, and it turned out that that crisis was solved by an even bigger crisis. Well, Some things happen in the Sparring less than a week before the fight, Foreman was cut above the right eye. As his handlers, Dick Sadler and Archie Moore, examined the damage, it was obvious that the showdown would have to be postponed for at least one month. Ali was despondent at first. But everybody's here, the world is here, the biggest event in all history. People are flying at this moment. We're talking plane loads on the way here. Cameras are here, technicians. The world is sold out all throughout Venezuela, Peru, all throughout Mexico, Africa, England. Tickets are sold and all the money's got to be refunded. It's just a big mess. And I just wish we could do something, bring Joe Frazier over. We'll fight him or... or We'll fight George if the fight is stopped on the cut, and if the cut gets worsened, then we'll have a contract saying we'll have to fight again in six months. Let's do something to get this thing on. Ultimately, the month-long delay benefited Ali both physically and spiritually as he managed to take advantage of the extra time. More than anyone, Muhammad Ali seemed to sense and draw power from the location from Africa that he was close to his roots. Many evenings he would sit here on this walk by the Zaire River, seeming to draw strength from the river itself, from the primordial surroundings, and ramble on talking about what he was going to do to George Foreman, how the plan was going to develop, seemed to draw strength as the days went by. As the endless days after the cut went by, he got stronger and stronger. As he ruminated with Angelo and his other companions as to what he was going to do to George Foreman when that fateful night came up. I'm going to float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. George can't hit what his eyes can't see. <laughs> now you see me, now you don't. You think you will, but, but I know you, you won't. won't. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. It's, 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 this is going to be a good fight. I want to say that I uh, plan to make this my last fight, and I'm going to shock the whole world. I think it's befitting that I go out of boxing like I came in 10 years from the day I beat Sonny Liston, destroying another Sonny Liston who I idolized Sonny Liston. He jumps ropes like Sonny Liston. He walks around with a stare at his head, face like Sonny Liston. He's awkward and slow and he hits hard like Sonny Liston. And they think it's befitting that 1974 stage couldn't be set no better, that I retire this man just like I did Liston. Right. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, Angelo yeah, Dundee. Is that all the time I get? Okay. Thank you. Ben Dugabula and Dick Don't do that train Get away. Away. Don't do that train <laughs> away. Get away. For bringing Gaining momentum, Ali even questioned the champion's desire to fight. I predict that whenever the fight is set, he might not show up. Et je suis sûr que avant que le combat ne soit, ne soit, ne soit euh, prêt, il va disparaître. I just want all helicopters guarded, private boats, private jets entering this place. I want the airport. I'm serious. I want the president. I want all of you Zions to be on guard. Watch all strange boats slipping in. They might take him out. Bus station. Watch the bus station. Bus station. Oh. Watch everything. Watch the watch the elephant caravans. He might sneak up an elephant. Watch everything. Please, Dick Sadler, slick. And Archie Moore is quick. Everything moves. Watch everything moving, unidentified <laughs> objects leaving Zaire. 
Please watch him closely. Je voudrais, je voudrais que les Allemands soient plus près de euh, John Roman. The man won't out. The man won't out. However, with his cut healed, Foreman's confidence was also at full strength. Should be a reported about is that I'm ready to fight healthy and if nothing happens between now and the day of the fight there will be a fight on the 30th and I'll be doing my best to win and as evidence everybody's seen what I do I go out and try to do the same thing to everybody I won't be trying to change tactics he called me at the eve of the fight at 10 o'clock p.m. in his room. He had a big uh, suite in the uh, Intercontinental Hotel. And I went there to see him. And I asked him, what's wrong, brother? He said, uh, Bula, I want you to do something. So I would like you to organize, to invite also the British, British champion. Now, what is his name again? Joe Bagner. Joe Bagner to come and say, I said, you want to fight the two the same day, the same night? He said, yes. I said, no, you cannot do it. I waited until the morning. Next morning, I went to, to see Ali. I said, Ali, man, you be, better be careful. Foreman settled for fighting Ali only, and fight night finally arrived, as did Zaire's moment in the sun, which actually took place around 3 a.m. local time. You know, boxing myths are born. When someone misinterprets a fact, then repeats it over and over and over again in the press, pretty soon it's accepted as fact. Let's explode one such myth. Angelo Dundee didn't loosen the ropes in Zaire. Right here on this spot, the, the ring in the middle of this football field had ropes that were sagging badly. When Angelo saw that, he went and got Bobby Goodman. They tried to tighten those ropes as much as they could. Finally, they got to the point where no matter how much they tightened, it would only still be sagging. He went in, into the dressing room, told Ali, hey, these ropes are loose. That's as good as we can do. And Ali said, well, we'll have to use that. It wasn't Angelo Dundee that was loosening the ropes. It was... Muhammad Ali's fertile mind that created the rope dope which became the factor that won the fight for him. The ill-fitting ropes were just part of a most unusual setting, even by Ali's circus standards. Native African dancers filled the stadium floor just minutes before we made our way from the dressing room. Zaire had set a dramatic stage for the action to come. The one thing I learned upon my return to Africa was the fondness and accuracy with which the people of Kinshasa and Zaire remember Foreman and Ali in their epic fight. And why not? It established their country in international circles. And you spread the map of Africa before any American. He can point out Egypt, he can point out Libya, he can point out South Africa because of the conflicts, but he points out Zaire because of the rumble in the jungle. In a moment, we'll return for a further look at that fight, which the people here in Zaire call simply the greatest fight ever.